So our next speaker is one of my favorite people in the world and also somebody that I so um, value listening to because she is such a wise person and has so much experience uh, in our field. And that's our own Dr. Pat Nishimoto. So I'm just gonna do a brief uh, introduction and then we're gonna we're going to move into this. So again, thank you, Pat, for agreeing to to come today and and talk with us. So Pat was a, so she sent me this bio. So full disclosure, this is from Pat. Pat was an army nurse for 33 years, 10 months, and then there's a space. So I'm sure she has a couple of days and hours in there. Um, and she has continued and she continued to care for military patients and families as Tripler's oncology palliative care clinical nurse specialist. She retired in September 2021 and today volunteers at the Tripler neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit. As a baby cuddler, she no longer has to do physical fitness tests or mess with computers. She and her husband enjoy cruising in their retirement years. That's cruising on a boat, Pat. Um, they have 19 godchildren in Europe, Hawaii, and throughout the mainland. And I also will say that she is a very enthusiastic uh, and valuable volunteer with Kukua Mau. So we're going to turn it over to you, Pat. All right. So uh, I, I'm really glad to be with you today uh, to talk about compassionate care. It's something that is very important to me. Okay, I'm hoping that we can use this as a time for discussion about what is compassionate? Does it really matter when we're so worried about the bottom line now? And what's the recent decade of hoopla about it from so many people, researchers, educators, clinicians, all of those people, what's going on? To start with asking about what the heck is compassion? So this is gonna be one where you put your hand up if you agree, if it is pity, is it sympathy, is it evidence-based? And she is putting up the poll right now. So if you would answer what you think it is and you can have more than one thing if you want. Good. Pat, I'll just read some of the things that people are putting in the chat. Okay. Em empathy, Empathy in action, to suffer with, being okay. with the person, empathy and authentic concern. Oh, excellent. Very okay. good. Okay. What, what are your thoughts about this? Because it can, some of you had more than one answer, I think, about that it could be sympathy and pity, or it could be sympathy and evidence-based. What are your thoughts about that? You can open up and just talk. Hi, Dr. Pat. This is Juliana. Hey, um, Juliana. I think that's a, hi there. I, I think that's a really great question. You know, can can it can empathy, I guess, be evidence based? And yeah, my answer, of course, is yes. I believe so. I think what we need to start with that sometimes, as providers, we tend to look over is really establishing that rapport first off because. You know, if we don't gain the trust of our of the people that we're caring for, we're not really going to find the root cause of what's going on with them. So we can address that. A lot of it's the shameful things that they may not want to talk about, including cultural that they may be embarrassed to speak to someone about that doesn't uh, like understand what where they're coming from culturally. Um, and I think that's where the evidence base comes in. You know in yeah. order to be really member-centered. And I think that's what our focus is, becoming member-centered. I think really getting to know, taking the time to get to know the person is really important. And I think by doing that, you can develop empathy for the person. I don't think pity is anything that anyone wants to do nor receive. Sympathy, not necessarily, but empathy is really what we're looking for to go forward and to move forward in a productive manner as a care team. And, and again, in order to do that, the most important thing, at least in my experience dealing with, um, dealing with humans, people, is just sitting down and letting yes. them know that you're not there to 
in a threatening way. Some people are afraid of healthcare systems and some people are afraid of dying and some people are afraid of being sick. And you really have to sit there and talk to that person to get to know what their fears are, what their hopes are, what their goals are. And, and sometimes just having that talk is so much more important than jumping into an assessment. Um, so I, to answer your question, yes, there can be both. I love it. And you taught me that. <laughs> I was just sitting here thinking, can I tell everybody you're my student? I love it. Thanks. <laughs> Lifelong student. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And I love the comments. I can see the chat line. So to me, compassion is not some airy fairy thing. I think it's a part of excellent health care. And I don't think that it's sympathy or pity, although pity is commonly confused with compassion. They're very different. To me, when you feel sorry for someone, it's mainly saying, I hear your pain. You're acknowledging their plight. I think uh, pity, uh, Juliana sort of referred to that. People don't want pity because when you do that, It's like feeling for concern for somebody that you think is inferior or weaker than yourself. And you feel superior to that person. I can help you, you poor soul that's suffering, right? Compassion, on the other hand, you don't see that person to be weak or inferior in any way. Instead, it encourages a broader view through common experience. So a lot of what um, Juliana was saying about sort of looking at what are your commonalities and really sitting and hearing them, what they have to say and being a part of that. I started with telling you I'm a retired army nurse. So of course, I wanna give you two examples of military nursing compassion in action. So during the civil war, A hundred years before we started progressive patient care, one nurse wrote of separating patients according to their needs, same as progressive care. This is her quote. My ward was now divided into three rooms and under favor of the matron had managed to sort out the patients in such a way that I had what I called my duty room, my pleasure room, and my pathetic room and worked for each in a different way. One, I visited with a dressing tray full of rollers, plasters, and pins. Another, with books, flowers, games, and gossips. A third, with teapots, lullabies, consolation, and sometimes a shroud. That was written by Louisa May Alcott. To me, that is compassion. Not sitting and feeling sorry for the wounded soldiers, but looking at what could be done to help make it better, right? My second example is from World War II, a soldier who lost their their arm during the war and he was stationed at Walter Reed in Washington, DC. He asked one of the young Lieutenant nurses walking past if he would, if she would help him light a cigarette for him. She looked at him. She reached into her pocket. She pulled out a pack of cigarettes and a book of matches because these were the days that nurses smoked in the report room. You older nurses, remember that? She tossed the matches and the cigarettes into his lap and told him, you can do it. And he did. That army nurse empowered him to see he could be independent and not have to rely on the pity of others. That act of compassion And forethought resulted in that wounded soldier to enact a national grant for military nursing research that continues to this day. Senator Daniel K. Inouye never forgot what that army nurse did for him. Can you imagine having one arm and trying to figure out how to light a match? I think that nurse is very smart. Leo, thank you. Leo Biscaglio wrote, too often, We underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. I I think that the delivery of compassionate care does begin with empathy. 
But my question is, empathy alone, is that enough to help you and take care of things? I really like what, uh, I just want to comment. Um, Dan wrote that he teaches that to all of the nursing students. Thank you very much. Because I may be having some of those nursing students as my nurse. Rachel wrote that pity distances you from the suffering of others. And I think that's true so that uh, we don't take it in, right? So tell me if you'll take off your mic and open it up, unmute yourself and tell me, what do you think? If I had empathy, is that enough for me to have so that I can give compassionate care? I also told Pat that if people want to put it in the chat awesome because of that. where they are. Sometimes people are in loud nursing uh, rooms, Pat, so they can't oh, necessarily okay. share. <laughs> All right. I miss being in person with people and watching and seeing your faces. Sorry. Hey, Dr. I Pat, just, this is your... Go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. This is your old student, Mosey Williams, from a while back. Mosey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I hope you've been well. Um, I think to answer the question, I think empathy is a great place to start because in, in trying to be with the person and put yourself in their shoes, you may be able to uh, see more of what they might need in that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, in in building that relationship, you can um, kind of cater the care that you're giving to be more to what they, they may specifically need as opposed to um, recommendations and things that we may just think offhand. Good. Thanks, Mosi. And somebody else started to speak? This is Susie. I believe you have to have a sense of humor. Yes. Because it, you, we all know this is a, it's a sad subject and you can find humor in things, you know, it doesn't have to be so serious all the time. You know, um, when my brother was uh, dying, I remember him saying he was uh, calling up places and he was planning his post funeral get together. And he goes, you know, I, I don't want to look cheap, you know? And I says, he says, I call people and they ask, what is this event for? And he says, it's for my funeral. He says, they never know what to say. And I says, are you just, so I think you have to have a sense of humor. He says, I just don't want to feel, I don't want to look cheap. So I want to order my food ahead of time. I don't know when it is, but I want to order my food ahead of time. <laughs> Thanks, Susie. Yes. Oh, Mary Elizabeth, you are on it. Absolutely. It's two parts. It's about knowing the resources to assist them. and taking action. That was the point of my first two army nurse examples was not just having that empathy or, or recognizing what they were going through, but then using critical thinking and then going on and coming up with a plan to reduce that. Because I think uh, if you have empathy alone, you can become overwhelmed or even distressed. And then if you're overwhelmed, you're not very effective in your ability to do anything to help them, is what I think. So thanks, Mary Elizabeth. Great segue. I, I believe, obviously, compassion is a key component, but I do think it's lacking in terms of its provision, and it's in much need of improvement. You know, I walk through the halls of, of Tripler now, and... Um, it's very much, they've leaned more towards civilian world and bottom line things. It, it's a different world. And I've only been gone a year. Um, it's, it's amazing. Um, to me, compassion is described as intelligent kindness. And it really affects how people perceive care. I, I wanna give you an example. When my mom was in the hospital and getting ready to be discharged home, um, her physician came, in, came into the room. Um, she was going home for home hospice. The thought was she only had a few days to live. He came in and he sat down. And then as he was talking with her, he put his hand on her shoulder. And he said, Emmy, I want to listen to your heart and lungs before you go. And he leaned over and he listened. There was no need for him to listen to her heart or lungs. 
she was going to die. She was going home to hospice. There was nothing medically that needed to be done. But that touch and taking that time, what a difference it made for our family. It made me cry. Um, and it made my dad, who felt that the hospital was kicking her out, that they still cared about my mom. So to me, that's intelligent kindness. I think um, I want to emphasize to me, compassion is about feeling for others who are in distress or pain. And you use warmth and empathetic concern. And then you have the motivation to act with compassion to relieve that pain. Why is there a recent interest in the concept of compassion? And I think, Dan, you started to talk about that, that what you learned in the LNAC course. What's the one thing I should know about you in order to provide you the best possible care? I love that. It's one of the things that I used. But why, why are they caring about it recently? What's this compassion thing? How does that bring in money or what, what good does it do when we're being bombarded with all these other things that we need to be doing? Hi, it's Dan. I have a theory, a couple of, of uh, hypotheses. Um, one is that um, too much health care is provided to people that they don't really want. And so that is both bad for the patient and bad for the health care system. Good. And the other is a, a, a growing awareness of and um, commitment by more and more healthcare providers, particularly in our palliative field of providing care that is aligned with people's values, goals, and preferences. And that's what advanced care planning is. But, you know, you don't have to be a palliative nurse. And I teach this to my students and my co and colleagues. And you can be a, a bedside nurse, a clinic nurse, an ER nurse. It, it doesn't take that long to ask people what's most important to them. And then, and uh, also ask if they may have already put their wishes in writing in order to help people get care that's really uh, in accordance with what they, what they value most and what they're hoping to do in their life. I love that. And yeah, I, I think um, with the recent deaths that we've had, both uh, like with Betty White that she, and then with most recently, Jimmy Carter, they yeah. seem to be bringing up a lot about hospice care where he's decided he did not want to keep on doing treatments that he has decided to be on hospice care. If nothing else, it kind of, and I think the news people are trying to not promote that, but kind of give an explanation of what that's all about, because a lot of people think you need to do everything to the bitter end until you're hooked up to all machines. And I think, you know, that's the way it, it's not surprising. That's what he's doing because he was such a vibrant man doing everything that he just was tired of going in and out of the hospital, putting a bandaid on thing and going home and going back enough is enough. And I think it is a good learning experience for the public to see that you can die with dignity and be at home and be comfortable. How about uh, Rachel? What do you think? Is there a recent interest in compassion where you're working? Uh, I think that there, the reason there's, an, uh, if it is medical, I hope it's medical. I think it's because um, in medical staff is beginning to realize that um, strictly medical technical interventions are not leaving people in any state that we could call healed. Yeah. That um, as long as there's not some sort of emotional uh, component, spiritual component to the care, then that's not total care. And, and even though maybe they're not competent to deliver that kind of care at this point in time, medically speaking, um, I think they realize that there's something, there's something missing. Uh, interesting. Those are great replies. I really appreciate that. Um, I think that part of sort of building on what you just said, 
I think the recent interest about compassion is due to learning about consequences when compassion is not part of patient care. Some of the things that Dan was talking about or that Juliana wrote about. So uh, I think, uh, can you list some of those things on the chat line? Can people put when there's not compassion in healthcare, what happens? What are the consequences? Please write some of those things down. Unhappy families, yep. Gaps in care and trust, good. Assumptions, yeah. Patient satisfaction scores, yes. Judgment, yeah. Misaligned and more expensive care, very good, Emma Shea. Yeah, confusion. Hey, Alan, staff burnout, very good. Thanks, thank you, perfect. Depression, yeah. Depression on the part of the patients and maybe the staff. Ah, oh, wow, Wendy, that one hurts. Oh, that makes me sad. Uh, that makes me wish that there had been a compassionate nurse there. Yep, less motivations to participate in their care. Absolutely. You guys are coming up with great things. And I think I think those consequences are being felt by people in administration. Um, because they're the ones that sort of can can or cannot be a challenge in us having time to provide some compassionate care. Although I think the gentle touch like that doctor did, it didn't take long for him to do that. It made a real difference for our family. Um, it heals all parties involved. I love it, Rachel. This sort of reinforces all the things you said. There's increased patient and family complaints. Healthcare costs go up because when that happens, there's misaligned. There's more expensive care, like Emma Shea said. There's adverse medical events because people don't want to participate in their care and, and they're feeling all burnt out. I think that um, when there's compassion, you can reduce that symptom burden that patients have. You can help them with quality of life. You enhance their quality of care ratings, which is what somebody talked about. I uh, Let's see, somebody wrote something about the fact that quality of care ratings, that makes a big difference. Um, bye, Stephen, thank you. Um, and I think that people do see it as a, a standard of care. When we become detached from patients, we actually just trigger more distress and disappointment in ourselves because we realize we're not the kind of person we wanna be for our patients, right? The whole reason why we became doctors or nurses or social workers or counselors. We, we have this idea that if we put up barriers, we're gonna protect ourselves emotionally. So um, I love it. Dan, you talked about the moral injury or moral distress. Um, that is absolutely right. Yeah, and that does happen when we don't take the time to learn. Yes, okay. Did everybody get to see this slide? When someone is going through a storm, your silent presence is more powerful than a million empty words. I think that uh, compassion can lead, um, can help you cope with suffering. It gives you strength. It helps you to take compassionate action and it helps to prevent what many people call compassion fatigue, right? What do you think about compassionate fatigue, compassion fatigue? I wanna tell you a story. I worked with a wonderful social worker, Ken Lee. And um, because we worked at Tripler together in the military surrounding, when we would do teaching at Tripler, we would talk about uh, how sailors on a ship 
would go out every day and clean the barnacles off of the ship. And he talked, gave the analogy that as healthcare providers, many times we build barnacles around ourselves to try to protect ourselves. And then he would ask people, what happens when you don't scrape off those barnacles? Well, the ship tips over and it can even sink if you don't wipe off those bar barnacles. And that's true for us as healthcare workers. If we allow our barnacles to grow and grow, I think what happens is we sort of tip over and we become cold and more abrupt and we don't want to feel. We don't really want to know those patients because it's it's too hard. So what about compassion fatigue? So compassion fatigue, the definition is it's work-related distress and exhaustion from absorbing emotional stress of others. And that can lead to depersonalized suboptimal care of patients, and it lacks empathy and compassion. So tell me about compassion fatigue, guys. Uh, do you think we can prevent it? Can we not prevent it? Hey, this is Sarah May. Um, sorry, I'm making that on. Uh, so I've actually been thinking a lot about compassion fatigue. I work at Adventist Health Castle and, you know, coming through COVID and, you know, we don't have the same amount of resources as we some places on the mainland and just people being so strong and so resilient consistently. Um, and then having to figure out how to care for others when they can barely care for themselves. And that like dichotomy of like, where do you put your energy and how do you um, continue to move forward uh, when you're exhausted, right? Yes. And we, we teach a course on empathy at orientation day. But then in that course, we actually talk a lot about self-care because if we don't, if we don't pour into ourselves and if we don't care and give ourselves just as much compassion, we burn out everywhere. And um, I think the the big challenge I'm seeing in people right now is, is that they, they aren't valuing caring for themselves as much as they should. So now everything seems exhausting and overwhelming and it's affecting all layers of care, whether it be their home life or their work life. And it's just, it's an interesting outcome, I guess. Yeah. Interesting is one way to put it. Yeah. I think, uh, Louise, do you want to talk about the all caregivers are at risk for compassion fatigue? Yeah, sorry. I'm here. <laughs> I'm at work. So I'm trying to finish up stuff. Oh, um, no, 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 don't be sorry. I, um, I think, yeah, all caregivers, um, ideally, even family members, because when we're taking care of patients, we're thinking about, you know, them as a whole. So ideally, um, anybody's at risk for it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be medical team or the medical staff. Yes. Of course, we see it more maybe in our workplace because we're dealing with it on a more regular basis, um, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of different patients and things like that. But um, overall, I think you know, anybody's at risk for that. Absolutely. Nice. I, I think you're Dr. right. Pat, yes. This is Juliana. And I have something to add to that. You know, those were yes. excellent examples. Um, you know, what, what I've noticed a lot of and what I've personally experienced is not so much compassion fatigue for my patients mm -hmm. um, at work, um, but I have a disabled family member at home. Mm. And so I'm spending all day long caring for strangers. Um, and then I come home and have to care for my family member that's disabled. And I find myself having no patience for my family member after working an eight to 12 hour shift taking care of strangers. And I'm going, I took care of like three people that are worse off than you today. I don't, I'm tired and I don't want to hear it. And then I feel guilty. Um, and and I, and I had, and it was really difficult to, to face that and, and hear feedback from that. But what I learned from it and something that I've always struggled with is self-care. You know, once I addressed the self-care and took a step back and realized that, you know, I'm a human being and I can't be all for everyone. And yeah. that if I don't care for myself, then I'm, I'm screwed as a nurse and as a family member. You know, pretty much, I, I and to myself, and so 
it's really a fine balance for our generation that's ta- that I call it the sandwich generation that's caring for you know our 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 parents or our disabled family members as well as our kids. I mean, I'm a mom too with kids at home, and so I, it's definitely a juggling act. And to be able to juggle all that while still being human and experiencing our own emotions, um, I think really brings to light what we as healthcare professionals are dealing with, especially after the two years of of the pandemic, you know, where, and and the abuse as healthcare providers that we're receiving from the same people that we're trying to care for. So it's definitely a conversation to be had. It's definitely something that Dan was saying, ANA is, you know, working to address. And that's really so important because not a lot of people in the industry are getting the message and it's really needs to be addressed. Thanks for letting me share. No, thank you. Um, and, and Wendy, I, I read your comment. I'm, I know that I have patients in the past that I wish I could have done more for them. I think I did the best that I could at that time, but with experience and learning more from colleagues and other people. Um, I wish that I could take care of them now because I could do a better job, but um, it does help to have somebody else that you can talk to about what happened and not keeping it for yourself. To me, that's part of self-care. I love it. And Carmen, I really appreciate you putting in about the um uh, moral injury and the broken system. Thank you. I will look that up. Um, This is great. You guys are wonderful. Um, Next slide. Oh, personal boundaries, Alice. Yeah. So I think, um, can, is it okay if we stop and talk about personal boundaries for a second? I'm watching your Uh, face. you're, You're in charge, Pat. I know, but I'm watching to see if they nod their head or they go, oh, shit, get this over with. I just need to know. Let's talk about, I'd like to hear about personal boundaries, Pat. Oh, good. I'll pay you later, girl. So uh, I think personal boundaries, we all learn that when we're going to school. And um, but I think you have to decide for yourself about how those personal boundaries may change with different situations and and do different things. Um, thank you, Alan and Sherry. I will pay you too, along with uh, Jeanette. So um, I think, um, so I went way beyond personal boundaries for some of my patients, but they were extraordinary cir- circumstances We had a patient from Pacific Islands who uh, came to our hospital. She had stage four disease. She developed a horrible infection. She was here with her sister. Um, She had, she didn't want to go back to her place, even if we could have gotten her there. She didn't want to go back because, uh, She showed me some of the scars from where her husband had beaten her and hurt her. And she didn't want to go back there because she was weaker and she felt she couldn't protect herself. Um, When I found out her daughter was in Alaska, um, I called the, the one hospice that was available in that area where the daughter lived to ask them if somehow we were able to get that patient to Alaska who didn't have health insurance, and she was getting medical care from Tripler because she was from the Pacific Islands, um, would they be able to give her hospice care? Um, We did lots of conversations and talking and trying to figure it out, um, but finally realized that with her her lung mets, she wasn't going to be able to fly on that plane. And so I have a great husband um, who's sitting right beside me in case I screw up with anything on this computer. He's ready to come help me. But um, he he agreed that we could bring that patient home 
to be with me because, because she had that infection, she was in isolation um, and she couldn't go outside. And Pacific Island for her, it was really important to be outside and have fresh breeze. And they won't let us open the windows uh, at our hospital. So anyway, we brought her home. Her daughter flew in from Alaska. And uh, so we had the daughter, the sister, and the patient living with us. And um, Hospice Hawaii came to our rescue at that time. I called them and asked them if they could provide hospice coverage for somebody who had no insurance here. And, and they were able to do it. Um, and she stayed with us and had some family here. People from the Pacific Islands, the patient rep, he and uh, his wife came over and we had a meal together and we did prayers together. That was the best thing to me that could have ever happened. But if I had been with my strict boundaries, that would have been a definite no-no. Um, anyway, she died very comfortably at our home and hospice came and pronounced her and things worked out. But I think sometimes when you've got somebody in a crazy circumstance where everything looks like it sucks, you, you need to think outside the box and not just stick. Look, oh, I love it. I see heads nodding. Thank you. You're not turning me into the Gestapo for doing this. Anyway, uh, so I think you have to think about um, what are your boundaries and not that you're going to do this all the time, but there may be something that's really important, right? We talked about what happens if we have that, quote, compassion fatigue. You see that I've got it in quotes, right? Um, we think we're protecting ourselves by putting up barriers. I think it leads to moral distress, sadness, and burnout. And if you're experiencing compassion fatigue yourself, you really don't want to learn about it. Actually, you may be sitting there right now in front of your computer screen thinking, Nishimoto, why do I want to learn about compassion when I think that's the whole reason I'm having all this distress? Well, I think that's a good question. And here's what evidence-based science has to tell us. But first, I'm going to uh, do a little bit about EBP. I think we work in an age of EBP. It's become the gospel. And it's really the prevailing view for a lot of healthcare professionals since the 1990s. It's supposed to be an integration of clinical experience and expertise, patient values, you know, the best research for making decisions. And I think that it's led to some improvements, that it has improved things, but no matter how well-rounded or how well-intentioned EBP is, I, I think that it has a very narrow focus on research. And it silences those of us who are clinicians and patient experience-based knowledge. So I, I think it's important. EVP is important. And that's why we're talking about this today, because I think people don't listen if they think that it's not evidence-based in some ways. So let's look at what EVP has to say about compassion fatigue. All right, so what they found is it does not cause fatigue. What, seriously? So the, the social neuroscience and also self-care investigators, they said that actually what it is, is empathetic, and I misspelled that, sorry, uh, distress fatigue. So let me repeat that again. Fatigue and exhaustion experienced by us due to caring for people is not compassion fatigue. It's empathetic distress fatigue. How'd they come up with that? Well, they used functional MRIs and they found that the fatigue that people experience is related to over-identifying with distressed patients and their relatives, other, and feeling their distress and pain as our own pain, self. 
They call that fatigue experience, empathetic distress fatigue. And they say it's because we've blurred the boundaries between self and other distinction. Here's the cool thing that they found. They found that if you do a functional MRI, it shows empathy and compassion tricks, triggers different parts of the brain, right? And when we empathize with somebody who's in pain, our brain activates similar circuits as the brain of that patient. How about that? Is that cool? So that's the reason we need to be aware of our reactions to others, because I think it helps us regulate our emotions. And when you've got that awareness, then maybe we won't experience so much fatigue, physical exhaustion, anger, powerlessness, emotional withdrawal to try to protect ourselves. And I'm going to stop for a minute because I, you guys are writing on the chat box and I can't keep up. I want to read this. So hold. I love it. Oh, Dan, that's nice. I like your semi-permeable boundaries. I love that. Why didn't I have that when I was working at Tripler? I could have used that. I got in trouble so many times. <laughs> anyway, more than you wanted to know. Um, but I wish I had known you earlier. Rachel. Yeah. Rachel, talk to me about how compassion can unintentionally draw a protective line between us and the other. Interesting. I didn't see it that way. Tell me what you mean. Um, yeah, now I'm thinking. Uh, it, what I meant to say was if we are um, experiencing feeling that this person that we are trying to help has a problem, but we ourselves do not have a problem, then that's the kind of barrier that I'm talking about that can lead to, uh, it's self-protective. Yeah, so the self, yeah. So I think that's more that empathetic uh, distress fatigue that does it, probably. That's where we get that barrier because we, we sort of withdraw and pull back. Is, am I getting it right for you? Yes. Yes. It's so it's unintentional self-protection. Yeah. You have a problem. I don't have a problem, but I can help you with your problem. Yeah. Because I'm smarter than you and I'm a nurse. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you dumb shit. And I'm not wounded. Yeah. Got it. Diane laughed at me. I cussed. Sorry. Um, I love Dan's comments. And oh, Wendy, thank you. You thought people would be more compassionate. I think it scares people is what happens, Wendy, uh, when they when they hear some of these words. Um, I, I don't think people are in this to be dirt bags, but I think they get scared by things they're not comfortable with. I don't know. That's that's what I think. So why do you be why should you be aware? OK, I think when we can understand what triggers those carrying fatigue, we can imagine uh, we can manage our emotions better. And I believe that we have the capacity to nurture and cultivate a more compassionate outlook. I think it can be cultivated with training, like education that Dan was talking about with his nursing students. I think that uh, altruistic behavior can emerge when we have a better understanding of the suffering other people, of other people. What are strategies that can do that? You guys have already put a lot of them out there. I love it. You did great. So I'm not going to make you write all of it again. You came up with great things. What I do want to do is, is sort of emphasize that compassion is complex, multidimensional construct, and it has four components, right? One is cognitive, where you're aware of suffering. One is affective, where you have a sympathetic concern and you're emotionally moved by that suffering. The third is the intentional component, where you have a wish or a desire to ease the suffering of that patient. And the fourth is motivational component. And that's that responsiveness or that readiness to help remove it, to have action. I think that's the important part. Now, everyday stress, social pressures, life experiences in general, a little long what we face at work, 
can make it hard for us to experience and fully express compassion to ourselves and to others. The best way is what all of you have said, which is self-care. So let's talk about how do you cultivate that self-care. Begin each day with compassion in mind. The Dalai Lama begins every day with saying this, as soon as I wake up, I remember Buddha's teaching, the importance of kindness and compassion, wishing something good for some, for others, or at least to reduce their suffering. Then I remember that everything is interrelated to the, the teaching of interdependence. So then I set the, my intention for the day that this day shall be meaningful. Meaningful means if possible, serve and help others. If not possible, then at least not to hurt others. That's a meaningful day. Another way is volunteering because that can help regulate stress and it, your immune function. It can help with cognitive functioning. I hope that's true. That's why I'm a baby cuddler. I'm volunteering. Health and well being. Next is actively listening. Those of you, uh, I see some of you that I've worked with, you used to see me walk around with a chair in my hand. And when pa I sat with patients, I would sit and I'd super glue my butt to the chair so that I could sit and really be fully present. And I'd try to put those distractions away about the stupid paperwork or the computer that needed to be taken care of, reports that are due, that idiot intern that asked me to do such and such. I try to put those away and really being present and paying attention to what was being said. Because I think, especially in a healthcare setting, listening, really listening, <laughs> provides relief to people. Because so many times we have time constraints. And so we don't always take the time to really hear what they're saying and to really be present. So when you have that chance to really listen, I think it makes a big difference. Have a self-compression break. What does that mean? Well, take a minute and think about something that causes you stress, right? And when that happens, tell yourself, I'm struggling in this moment and that's okay. I'm not alone. And then offer yourself some soothing words of acceptance. That would work for me, I will tell you. So the way I did self-compassion break is I would call Myrnie, who was a social worker at Tripler, and I would call her when I because I trusted her. I could talk to her and she didn't tell anybody what I said. When I was on my last nerve and when I needed to say, this sucks, Myrnie was there. And it helped me to stop and think and have time for myself. It's part of mindfulness because you can cultivate compassion when you're bringing attention to your experiences that are happening right now. And it helps you to recognize distress in yourself and helps you keep an emotional balance in the face of adversity, right? Keeping a daily journal and writing down moments that you experience compassion, anything you felt bad about or anything you judged yourself harshly for. When I was a brand new clinical nurse specialist, Colonel Midge Bader was my supervisor and she made all of us as CNSs keep a daily journal. We had, she didn't talk about compassion, but we had to write the best thing that happened today and the worst thing that happened. And then you had to write what you were going to do differently next time to make that worst moment change into a better moment, either for you or for that patient. Next slide. I think that we need to really look at commonalities. And instead of focusing on how different this patient is from you, they're homeless, they don't take a bath, whatever. Recognize that that homeless person is a mother the same as you, or that they have brothers the same as you. 
I think when we can focus on commonalities, we see him more as a person and remind ourselves we're all connected in this larger humor, human experience. Guided imagery, it, uh, meditation can really have positive outcomes. It can increase self-compassion. It can help with other focused compassion. It takes you to focus on feelings of kindness and goodwill towards yourself, your loved ones, and those not in your usual social group. So uh, next slide. Oh. We're going to do a meditation, and I have one online, so I need you to hold on. I'm going to try to open it. If it doesn't work, then Hope is going to open it. And if she can't open it... Please like stand up if you can, yes. or else you can remain sitting. But if you're standing, stand with your feet about shoulders width apart, arms at your side. Notice the sensations in the soles of your feet as they touch the floor. Really feel yourself grounded to the earth. Notice the sensations that are there in the soles of your feet. Perhaps heat or cold, moisture, dryness, tingling, throbbing, perhaps. To better feel the sensation in the soles of your feet, you may try rocking your body gently from side to side, slowly. Noticing that as you move your upper body, the sensations in the soles of your feet change. You can rock from side to side or front to back. And then come to standing. And now I would invite you to take some slow steps, really noticing as you take each step how your weight shifts from foot to foot. And as you place each foot down, again, the changing sensations of the soles of your feet. As you take a little circle around the room. Feeling how the earth supports your body. Maybe even taking a moment of appreciation for the fact that your small little feet support your entire body. They work hard for us. Let's continue to walk slowly, feeling the soles of your feet on the ground. And now return to standing again, being still, and expanding your awareness to your entire body, feeling the field of sensations from head to toe, allowing yourself to feel whatever you're feeling, allowing yourself to be exactly as you are in this moment. Thank you for doing that with me. This is the site of that uh, meditation. If you would like to be able to play it at work. Um, you, you were talking about, uh, I, I want to go on to COVID because somebody brought up COVID earlier. Can you change it? It, it really was the great disruptor about compassionate care. 
that mask, uh, those face shields going in, we weren't able to really touch people. We lost that, I think, emotional connection. I know I did. It can be hard to provide compassionate care when you can't see people's faces and what they're going on. And with all of that happening and lack of resources at our facilities, maybe, that added to our fatigue and exhaustion. And when you're exhausted with all this other stuff, it really affects your ability to care. You know that. But I think we can re resurrect and we can rekindle those embers. I think we do it through self-compassion. That means treating ourselves with the same kindness and compassion that we would give a good friend. It means being kind and supportive and understanding towards yourself, particularly when you feel you failed, rather than being harsh or judgmental. This is one that my friend Joyce Wong uses all the time, supportive touch. She always talks about uh, it's an easy way that you can do it when you're at work or if you go into the bathroom and you just need to have a little bit of support because it activates your care system and the parasympathetic nervous system. It helps calm us down to feel safe. The skin is our largest organ, but it's also incredibly sensitive. It releases oxytocin when we're touched. It helps us feel secure. It helps with the stress and it calms the cardiovascular stress. So we're going to try that now. Um, I want you to, when you notice you're under stress, I want you to take two or three deep breaths. Can you do that right now? Gently place your hand over your heart. Feel the gentle pressure and warmth of your hand. Sorry, you can't see it. Try putting both hands on your chest. Notice if there's a difference if you put one hand or two hands. Feel that touch on your chest. If you wish, you can make small circles with your hand on your chest. Feel that natural falling and rising of your chest as you breathe in and as you breathe out. It's an easy thing to think about using. Um, I do want to talk about uh, so, Judy, good question. Hope, can you copy that thing from my slide? But all of you are welcome to my slides if you want to. And um, Hope can put the link on the meditation for you. Thanks. People brought up other things that you can do. Dietary choices, exercise, yoga, you know, different osteopathic manipulation, meditation, singing, humor for sure that uh, Susie brought up at the beginning, I absolutely believe in that. I think that that helps. Thanks, Hope. I just have one more minute. Jeanette, can I have an extra two minutes? Of course, Pat. I love it. You, I'm paying you. Okay, so um, I'm going to stand. We'll see if I can move this thing up. So you know that I was an Army nurse. And one of the things we did in the Army when I went down for basic training was we did, we called cadence and we went marching and we used a lot of humor to get through it. So I'm going to sing off key and then I'm going to point at you, make sure that points. I don't know how to get it to point. And you're going to say, honey, honey. And then I'm going to point again and you're going to say, babe, babe. People ready? Okay. Hey. Okay. I came here to be a nurse. Honey, 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 I came here to be a nurse, baby. Hey, hey, hey. hey. I came here to be a nurse. That is why I drink and curse. Honey, <laughs> oh, baby, mine. No, sirree, 
No siree. No, they'll never make an army nurse out of me. I came here to be a nurse. That is why I drink and curse. Honey, oh, babe, be mine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, love it. I do. I think singing and nice. humor, it, it can make a huge difference in getting over all the crap that we face sometimes. So, um, so you might be sitting there thinking, okay, Pat, you know what? I'm compassionate. I come to Kakua Mao for God's sake. I, uh, I am compassionate, but I am working with some dirt bags. How do I get them to sort of look in that compassion, right? So hope if you can go to the next slide. These are just fun ideas that I took off online. Um, think about putting this up on a whiteboard for your staff to respond to, or maybe you could um, um, put it up on a Monday, but leave it up there for a week until Tuesday. I've got five of them. And I just realized if you're recording this, they may not see it. So it's take a minute Monday. Take a minute to think about and then write about a random act of kindness you can do to make someone's Monday even better. Next slide. Tuesday is Tolerance Tuesday. What do you believe is the best way to spread compassion? Next one. Wednesday. Hope. What's the question Wednesday? I love this. This is like being on one of those uh, game shows on television. The answer is compassion. What's the question? <laughs> okay. Somebody uh, needs to be muted. Sorry. Uh, things we should say Thursday. What are some kind and supportive things we should say to each other more often? And then Friday is probably my favorite. Bucket filler Friday. A bucket filler is a kind, caring, genuine person who wants others to feel good. Fill someone's bucket by writing them a short note of how you observe them giving compassionate care. I love that. Okay. Next slide, Hope. I think promoting a values-based compassionate culture uh, can be part of an everyday working practice. I believe in you, every one of you, because I've seen you write on this. Just as many of us have faced many challenges in our careers, Alan Gamble's online, um, you know, Diane is online, Charlotte is online. Many of us have been around for years, but we figured out ways to remain compassionate and give the best care to our patients. And I know you who are way younger than we are and are still getting to be in clinical practice, you can provide compassionate care now and with all the future challenges you're gonna face. Thank you very much, mahalo. Wow, thank you very much, Pat, that was wonderful. I know, um... As you got people to respond and give comments in Zoom, and it's obviously a topic that is really um, very relevant for, for all of us. So thank you very much for doing that. We really appreciate it.